So the CMT Research Foundation is the only CMT organization with a full-time chief scientific officer, Dr. Keith Fargo. That's because we have one mission and focus, develop treatments and cures for CMT. Dr. Fargo has a PhD in neuroscience. And after working seven years at the Alzheimer's Association, where he led programs just like today, I cajoled him into joining our efforts, bringing his expertise in nerve biology and his expertise from the Alzheimer's Association to the CMT field. Now, Dr. Fargo leads all scientific efforts at the CMT Research Foundation and the Scientific Advisory Board. He will give us an overview of CMT, giving us some basic information to prepare us for the rest of the day. Hi, Dr. Fargo. Hi, thank you, Susan. I appreciate that uh, very kind introduction. Thank you very much. All right, so just some basics again. So what is CMT actually? Well, CMT can be defined as any inherited neuropathy, meaning that the nerves degenerate. Uh, and about 150,000 people in the United States and about 3 million people globally have CMT, making it one of the most common inherited neurological diseases. So that's about one in every 2,500 people. Now, uh, Charcot-Marie Tooth Disease has this, to some people, unusual name. And the reason it's called Charcot-Marie Tooth Disease is that the three people who first described it over 100 years ago uh, were named Jean-Martin Charcot, uh, Pierre-Marie, and Howard Henry Tooth, hence Charcot-Marie Tooth Disease. Uh, so it's been known as a disease for over 100 years, but the first, and suspected to be genetic since it is inherited, but the first gene for CMT was only discovered about 30 years ago. And since that time, progress has occurred very rapidly. We now know of more than 500 mutations in over 100 genes that cause CMT. Now, CMT is extraordinarily variable. Uh, in terms of the kinds of genetic mutations that can cause it, the symptoms that people have, uh, but we also know that there are some commonalities and we'll talk about those. We are gonna hear a lot today about the peripheral nervous system. So when we talk about that, I want to remind everyone that we really have two kinds of nervous systems in our body and they are connected. The central nervous system is the brain and spinal cord. So you can think of that as all of the nervous system that is encased in bone. Of course, the brain and the skull and the spinal cord and the spinal column. The rest of the nervous system uh, essentially serve as kind of highways of information or power lines that take information to and from the rest of the body. And you can see that highlighted here in yellow um, in this image. And the peripheral nervous system is really what makes possible movement, uh, muscle tone, as well as the body's ability to sense touch and the position of the limbs in space, et cetera. So what about the symptoms? Well, again, the symptoms are extraordinarily variable and they can lead from, they can um, range anywhere from somewhat mild um, all the way to very debilitating, and in some cases, people even have died um, from CMT, although that is fairly rare. Um, the symptoms typically start in childhood, although sometimes they can start much later in life as well. I met a man who was diagnosed with CMT in his 40s, um, and before that was unaware that he had CMT. Now, because CMT affects the uh, peripheral nervous system, you can experience things like a loss of sensation. And then because the peripheral nervous system also uh, provides information and input to the muscles, you can experience muscle wasting as well. Now, typically CMT affects the longer nerves first. And because your legs are longer than your arms, the nerves that supply your legs are longer than the nerves that supply your arms. So for most people, the symptoms begin in their feet and lower legs, progress upward in the body, and then for many people will uh, end up involving the hands and arms as well. And people can experience foot problems, uh, they can experience difficulty walking, uh, they can experience difficulty with balance. Um, the good news is that this generally does not reduce lifespan, although like we said, 
there are some very severe cases where people have passed uh, from CMT. Um, and beyond that, it can be quite debilitating. A lot of people with CMT use wheelchairs. Uh, many people with CMT have surgeries, including in some cases, amputations. One of the things that we know about CMT is that it's progressive, which unfortunately means it gets worse over time. So if you have CMT right now, without there being a cure or an effective treatment, it will get worse. We're here to change that. So what's happening in the nerves? Well, let's talk about that. We have a picture here on the screen um, of a, uh, a representative nerve cell. Now this is not drawn to scale because if it was this part of the cell, which is called the axon, would stretch from here to Pittsburgh, unless you're in Pittsburgh, in which case it would stretch from there to Los Angeles. Uh, it's enormously long, mind bogglingly long compared to the size of the uh, cell body, which is where you find the nucleus. So for example, with this kind of cell, the cell body is found in your spinal cord, but the single axon can travel three feet all the way down to innervate the muscles on the bottom of your foot. So if you think about this microscopic cell body that sends out a three foot long uh, process to uh, the muscles on the bottom of the foot, it's enormous. Now, in the case of many of the neurons in your nerves, they are encased with a fatty sheath called myelin, myelin. And that myelin is actually made up of many, many, many different what we call Schwann cells, which you can see here in blue. So a single, a single neuron with a long axon is encased in many, many of these Schwann cells. And of course, you have thousands and thousands of these neurons in each one of your nerves. Now, how does that Schwann cell form? Uh, well, it's kind of interesting, actually. And it starts out as just a regular cell that kind of attaches itself to um, the, the, uh, the axon. And then it wraps itself around many, many, many times, very tightly around that axon. And that forms this fatty layer um, called the myelin sheath. And the, <clears throat> pardon me, the purpose of the myelin sheath is, is uh, twofold at least. Uh, one of the things that it does is it speeds the electrical signals down the axon. So you can imagine with uh, three feet to traverse to get from your spinal cord to the bottom of your foot, um, you might need to speed those signals up sometimes in order for things to work the way they should. And myelin plays an important role in that. It also plays an important role in nourishing the axon and keeping that very long axon alive and healthy. So we know that there are uh, uh, two types of, well, many, many types, but two broad categories of Charcot-Marie Tooth disease. And we can call them CMT1 and CMT2. And there are others, of course. But broadly speaking, CMT1, we refer to that as being demyelinating. So the problem in CMT1 begins with the Schwann cells. In CMT2, we call those forms axonal, meaning that the problems with CMT2 begin with the axon itself. Now, it's important to say that both of these kinds of CMT eventually lead to the degradation of the axon, both kinds. And it's really thought that it's that degradation of the axon, whether it be the primary uh, uh, problem or the secondary problem, it's really the loss of that axon that drives the symptoms of CMT. In, of CMT. That'll be important to keep in mind for later. So what about the classification system? Well, there are many letters and numbers involved in classifying CMT. And we talked already about the difference between CMT1 and CMT2 broadly, uh, but you can also put uh, uh, letters after those numbers to further subclassify types of CMT based on the specific genes and the specific genetic mutations that are involved and based on the way those mutations are passed down through families. So let's take a closer look. 
What you see on the left here, this is a, uh, uh, a microscopic picture uh, from a healthy nerve. And what you're seeing here is lots of dark circles. Those are actually the myelin sheath. This is a cross section through the nerve. So you're, it's almost like you're looking head on into a pencil. Um, so you can see the uh, pale areas in the middle. Those are the axons. And the darker areas that encircle them, that's the myelin sheath. If you look here, this is a cross section from a nerve with CMT. You can see several things about it. Number one, the myelin sheath is thinner uh, around these axons. And number two, there are fewer axons. We can zoom in even closer and you can take a look here. This is uh, a, uh, an axon that is beginning to get sick. Um, uh, it's hard, I'll skip over that, but it's beginning to get sick. Uh, and then here's uh, an axon that is already quite sick. And you can see that the myelin sheath um, has thinned considerably. And if you look here at this arrow, it's pointing to an axon that doesn't even have a myelin sheath anymore. So the axons are, are changing, reducing in number and losing their myelin sheath. Well, how do the genes play a role in this? Well, this is what we call the central dogma of molecular biology. Genes are like recipes for building proteins. And we'll, but in order to go from the genetic recipe to the protein, you go through an intermediate step, which is RNA. So the genes are transcribed into RNA, and the RNA is translated into protein. If you change the recipe, you're going to change the protein, and you can end up with a bad protein. Um, in the case of uh, the genes that we deal with in CMT, um, we can think of these as typos. And the typos are called mutations. And they can lead to a number of different problems. They can lead to what we call a loss of function. You can think about that as having a recipe that's too bland because it forgot to tell you to add the salt. You can have a toxic gain of function. And you can think of that as a recipe that actually created, unfortunately, a poison. Uh, that will make you sick. That's a toxic gain of function. You can have too much of a protein. You can think of that as being like too much salt in the recipe, making the, the food inedible. Um, in CMT, these mutations affect either the myelin or the axons of the peripheral nervous system. These mutations can be passed on from parent to child, although it's very important to recognize that about five to 15% of the mutations are new, meaning they did not come from a parent. They actually arose uh, fresh, spontaneously in an individual. And that's called a de novo mutation. Now, this complexity might make CMT seem like it's an insurmountable problem. But I'm here to tell you that that is not the case. Uh, we have a lot of things going for us. One of them is that about 50% of people with CMT have a single type that's called CMT1A. Another thing that we have going for us is that four types together make up about 90% of people with CMT. Um, furthermore, some treatments may address multiple types of CMT. For example, treatments that could prevent axon degeneration, which we said is what drives the symptoms. Uh, there are also uh, research projects now into what we would call mutation agnostic genetic therapies, meaning that they can, the, they're genetic therapies, but they might help anyone with a mutation of a particular gene, regardless of which mutation they have in that gene. So I don't want you to lose heart. As a matter of fact, I want you to feel hopeful. We have many things going for us in CMT. Um, make no mistake, uh, CMT we know must be defeated. We also know it can be defeated, and we know that it will be defeated, and you're going to help us get there. So putting this all together, this is my last slide. I'm going to use just CMT1A as an example, and I selected that because it's the most common and because the next two talks you're going to hear about will be research projects related to CMT1A. So in CMT1A, the problem is that you have a duplication of a gene. Uh, that gene is called PMP22. And because it's duplicated, your body is producing too much PMP22 protein. That PMP22 protein then causes a degradation of the Schwann cells, 
and that degradation of the Schwann cells causes a secondary loss of the axons. You can see that here. And once the axons begin to be lost, because your muscles do work on that use it or lose it principle, the muscles begin to waste away as well. Uh, so that's what's happening in your body, broadly speaking, with CMT. And again, I know we went through a lot there, so feel free to come see me at the Meet the Expert session later.